Hi there. In this video, we will continue talking about uh, the uh, the next step after the uh, collection of the red flags. If you remember in the previous chapter, we said that when we start the investigation, and number one, we need to differentiate between fraud examination, forensic accounting, and auditing. Number two, we need to be aware of the governance structure of the company, starting from the board of directors, going to the audit committee, going down to the executive management, and then go down to the internal audit department and the internal control environment in the whole organization. The external auditor, who usually the first point of searching or investigating any kind of red flags, then might be followed by fraud examiner who can have more experience in fraud examination. They usually come and assess the red flags. The red flags are hints about uh, existing fraud. However, I cannot take the red flags as evidence for the fraud. It's just hands. And in this chapter, we will talk about what is the next step after the red flags is collecting evidence. Uh, the evidence, it's one of the main uh, or the key point in the, uh, in the fraud investigation. And any investigation that can be admitted in the court must have evidence. So how the evidence falls down in the whole investigation process, in the mind of the fraud examiner, he should be aware of building a story, a coherent story that has compelling case to be presented in the court. So the evidence is not an isolation from the whole story that will be presented to the court to get the court judgment. So when we build up the story, we need to make a case that can be presented. And for the case to be presented and accepted by the court, there should be some kind of evidence. And when we build up the evidence, we have to keep in mind different hypotheses. And for those hypotheses, we need to make sure there is no flaw or error or any point the court can catch against the presenter of the case, and then they can cancel the whole case. And there is a relation between the evidence and the hypotheses and we call it a matrix. And we will talk about this matrix later on. Uh, the point is that the evidence has different rules from the federal regulations. And for any evidence to be accepted in the court, it should follow all the rules of the federal government. When we build up the hypotheses, and make the matrix between them and the evidence, we should keep in mind our plan, our predictions. So before we start making any investigation, the examiner should have some kind of predictions. And this would be the beginning point for official investigation. If we raise any suspicion when we start building our prediction, suspicion about certain individual or about the whole management team, this suspicion by itself is not good enough. We should have evidence. And even the red flags, which we discussed in the previous chapter, is not good enough. We should have evidence. And I hope this brief introduction can highlight the importance of the evidence to corroborate or support the red flag or the suspicions. Now, how do we collect the evidence before we start tapping on the process of collecting the evidence and make the evidence admitted in the court? We need to go back and identify the definition of the fraud. For a fraud to exist, there should be some kind of incentive or pressure. There should be some kind of opportunity, which is weakness in the internal control, and some kind of justification for the fraud to happen. And 
we need also to know that the person might have one of the four goals that can push the person to commit fraud, either money or ideology or coercion or ego. And the process for the fraud to happen, it usually starts by the act of the fraud, the hiding or the concealment of the fraud and the conversion of the fraudulent item to become hidden. So for example, stealing inventory item, hiding them by making a journal entry, selling them to somebody and get the cash to convert everything to be ready in the hand of the fraudster to use them. So when we build up the prediction, we should keep in mind the definition of the fraud, the, 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 the motive of the fraud and the process of the fraud. Now we come to the evidence. When we start searching these items, what kind of evidence the examiner should collect? It could be verbal, because we know if somebody confessed that he made the fraud, this is by itself, it's a good evidence. So please remember the evidence is not only documents. It could be document, and this is what we call it real evidence. Or it could be circumstantial. It could be like circumstances that happen together that led to the fraud. So the evidence is not only a document, but it could be verbal, it could be real, it could be demonstration, it could be circumstantial. And no matter what kind of form for the evidence, the evidence should have some characteristics. And this is the federal rules for that. The evidence should be relevant. What does it mean? It should impact the decision of the users of this evidence. So if the examiner present an evidence in the court, this evidence will make a difference in the decision by the court. It could be material. What do you mean by material evidence? From where did I get this evidence? Did I get it from somebody inside the company or outside? If I get an evidence from outside, this is more reliable and has material effect than the inside. Because if you get the evidence from somebody outside the company, we trust this evidence. Number three, the competence of the evidence. It means how accurate is the evidence? Is it really accurate? Is it supportive to the case or not? Now, we take this evidence admit it to the court. But before we present it to the court, it should be authorized or authenticated. And once it is authenticated, it should not be altered. For example, if we get an invoice, the invoice to be authenticated, it should be original invoice. And if we try to keep this invoice as an evidence, we mean a chain of custody. What does it mean? A cover sheet on the evidence, to show who carried the evidence, at what time he received the evidence, and to whom does it give the evidence. So the chain of custody is like a cover sheet to show the exact date, the signature of the receiver of this evidence, and then if it goes to another one, then the recipient of this evidence and so on. Plus, we should keep the evidence in a safe vault, and we usually in the forensic lab, they keep all the evidence in a big vault that can be a good storage for the evidence. And now we need to keep in mind when we collect the evidence, we have to keep in mind that the fraudulent case could happen in good economy and in bad economy. So don't feel because the company is going bankrupt, we expect to see some fraud. No, it could be also in a good economy and when the fraud is committed during the good economy, it's really hard to find it because we feel everything is fine. So why the person is motivated to fraud? <coughs> Excuse me. So the examiner <coughs> should be aware of that. Now, <coughs> I explain the difference between the relevance, reliability, and validity or competency of the evidence. 
And here we put like a matrix for the reliability and the validity. Uh, usually we say the source or the document is reliable. It means it will not be questions, and this would be taking the high rate in materiality or reliability. If you get, for example, a bank statement from the bank, you cannot question this bank uh, statement because it's been issued by somebody outside the company. Usually reliable, the majority of the past information proved to be reliable. And for example, original invoice that has been signed by the customer. So although the document has been issued inside the company, but the signature of the customer proves that this invoice is reliable. Unreliable, it means a photocopy of the invoice. We don't usually uh, trust photocopy. Sometimes photocopy is uh, uh, similar to the original, but this is the kind of the unreliable uh, evidence. Unknown, it means the reliability of the source unknown. We don't know from where we get this one. So we make rating. When we present the evidence to the court, it's good to go for the A rating, the reliable evidence. Sometimes the court can accept usually reliable if the reliable evidence is not available. How about the validity, the accuracy, and the support to the case? It's either confirm the information corporate the case, or probable the information is consistent with the history, doubtful the information is not matching with the history, and cannot be judged if the information cannot be evaluated. And a good example for that, if we talk about an existing of dormant or fictitious customer, then we need to show that there are some invoices that has been issued to that customer, but there was no evidence that this customer is real and received the invoices. And because of that, we say here, yes, this is a valid invoice. Uh, the information is consistent with past accounts. If there is in the past, there was some kind of approval that this customer existed, because maybe the customer existed last year, but this year the customer uh, disappeared, maybe go bankrupt or left the uh, geographical location and so on. So we need to check the relevance of the evidence, the reliability of the evidence and the validity of the evidence to have the evidence accepted in the court. When the examiner is presenting all these evidences to the court, then the examiner has to prepare work papers. And those work papers to prove the conclusion of the examiner has to be prepared accurately because they will be checked by the judge. And the auditor has to make a, a, a basis for the conclusion supported by expert opinion in the field and testimony from the different witnesses. And then all the analysis and the database should be reference and cross-reference. It means the information must be matched with the evidence collected. And then we start organizing the work paper. First, we show a plan for the collection of the records, obtain an inventory of the records. We should have a list of all the items that we collected. We make template for the financial record and database. And by the way, when I say template, it doesn't ignore the Excel sheet that has all the data or any file that has the data. The template, it's just a summary prepared by the examiner that talks about the database. Then we enter the data from the record into the template, double and triple check to make sure that the records are correct. And then we review the record for the investigation. And then we organize the evidence and the analysis by date, by PE, by deposit amount, by disbursement amount. And then if we have different sorts, we analyze them. And then we review the record for patterns. Good example, we make sure to check writing habits of the person in charge of the account. Then we check the routinely written on certain dates. Then repetition of a checks written by date, the date, day of the week, and so on. Then periodic times when an account balance was low, performance of the basis on the revenue, the gross profit, and net profit. So here we take a certain transaction 
and then analyze it from A to Z. From the moment we issue the invoice to the collection by the customer to payment by the, 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 the client to deposit of the check in the bank and so on. And we can do the same for the supplier, collection of the goods payment to the supplier and so on. And then we review the record for unusual activity because some anomalies might happen and then analyze the cash transactions and the flow across multiple accounts. This uh, brief presentation can tell us how far is the evidence is relevant to support my case in the court and support the red flags that has been discussed in the previous chat. I will continue talking about the other characteristics of the evidence in the coming videos. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.